Hi everyone, my name is Gavin Thompson. I'm the founder of Academy Box. We are a UK based uh, company that specializes in e-learning consulting, e-learning content design, development and management, as well as Moodle LMS uh, hosting and support. I'll talk about LMSs and Moodle a bit later in this uh, tutorial. I just want to make a, a, a comment on where we found ourselves at the moment amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as you can see, I'm recording this uh, tutorial from my own home office because I'm in self-isolation. Self and we are really being forced to think out of the box at the moment and to, to work differently. I also believe that some of the adjustments that we're making now uh, will and should become part of a new norm of how we go forward. And one of those is, uh, areas is how we do training. And I think we're sitting for a real opportunity now for organizations to take a look at the traditional classroom uh, based uh, training and to look at how that can be moved to e-learning. A well-designed course uh, typically consists of four elements. The first is information transfer. Now this is simply the transfer of information from the instructor that has the information to the student that is enrolled in the course in order, order to obtain that information. The second of these elements is reinforcing activities. And these are hopefully fun, engaging activities that are designed to reinforce the student's adoption of the information. Next, we have content discussion. And these are opportunities that should be built into a well-designed course that gives the students uh, opportunity to discuss or debate the information that's being presented. And finally, we have a knowledge assessment. And these are mechanisms that we use to assess the student's understanding of the information and more importantly, the translation of that information into new knowledge or new skills. Okay, let's look at information transfer. Now, traditionally information transfer is done in the classroom, instructor to student. And typically the student is provided some form of printed course material at the beginning of the course. And then the instructor uses the majority of available class time to take the students through the course content, often supported by some form of presentation. In some cases, the students may also be given some form of pre-course uh, reading to prepare for the uh, course. Now in e-learning, information transfer is done offline. And, and by this, I mean, we take your uh, existing content and we break it down into multiple small modules. And when I say small modules, I, I don't believe any one module should be longer than 10 to 15 minutes. And the reason for this is that it allows a student to then progress through the course in their own time and at their own pace. The other thing is that it also makes information transfer uh, more easily repeatable. So in other words, if a student uh, is doing module number three, and at the end of module number three, they don't understand uh, the concepts or a concept, then they can quite simply redo that, uh, that, um, that specific module. And because it's a short module, only 10 to 15 minutes, they can keep on repeating that specific module until they grasp the concept. Now, information transfer and e-learning can be done by uh, a live recording of a classroom session, a narrated slide presentation, and this is a narrated slides presentation that you're watching now, a talking head lecture, or a number of other activity types. There are a number of different narration types that we can uh, use. The first of these is to employ the services of a professional voiceover artist to narrate our slides. Now this is an expensive option and it requires a lot of reviews of the narration and a lot of re-recording. And the other thing that's very important to note is it is difficult to modify your content at a later date as you then have to go and re-employ the, um, the services of the same uh, voiceover artist. The next is uh, that the actual instructor does what we call a talking head. Now this is a much more uh, professional polished production uh, and it is quite expensive because it involves uh, studio time with a green screen, which I'll talk about a bit later, and quite a fair amount of post-production editing. It also requires a fair amount of specialized skills and equipment. And it's fairly difficult to modify the content at a later date because you have to reproduce exactly the same environment for it to feel like the original. It's no big secret that many organizations are operating at suboptimal levels of operational service and quality excellence. Now the third option is for instructor to do a webcam insert. And this is a webcam insert that you're watching now. 
Now, I would have said five years ago that this wasn't really an acceptable form of building e-learning content. But now, today, I'd say that it's actually becoming more and more acceptable, especially with the popularity, the raising popularity of logging. It's obviously a lot cheaper to do, and it requires much shorter development times. And the, it doesn't require too much skills, uh, and can be done with very basic equipment. And it is fairly easy to change your content at a later date, uh, really because it's not this high polished uh, uh, production. And so as long as the instructor is wearing the same clothes and has the same hairdo and, you know, I haven't uh, gone and grown a beard in between, it will look fairly like the original to an acceptable extent. Another option that you may want to consider is text-to-speech. Now this uses a special software that converts written text into spoken word and that can be done in, in a number of different accents. Most professional e-learning authoring tools do have this functionality built into them. But personally, I like to use Amazon Polly as it's very good and it's free for most applications. It does require the author to learn just a few basic coding techniques in order to control the pauses and the punctuations. And one of the advantages of uh, text-to-speech is that it's extremely easy to make content changes at a later date because your, your um, words are going to come out exactly the same because it's done by a speech engine. But one of the downsides of text-to-speech is that some people do find that the digital voice is actually quite off-putting. Hey Gavin, I agree that some of the digital voices are not very authentic. But, if you use text-to-speech creatively, it can enhance your presentation. My voice is not trying to sound human, so is ideal for use with a supporting character. Most professional e-learning authoring tools also include avatar characters. Now I'll use our Articulate Storyline, and uh, Storyline has many different characters to choose from, with each character having different facial expressions and many different uh, uh, poses. Personally, I like to use avatar characters in my content because I believe it really enhances the e-learning experience. There are also a number of other activity types that we can use for information transfer. And these include uh, glossaries, knowledge bases, ebooks, videos, uh, links to external websites, and a number of different file types. Okay, let's talk about reinforcing activities. Now in a classroom environment, we use reinforcing activities to keep the students engaged, but most importantly, to embed key learning objectives. These reinforcing activities can be of an individual, group or class nature and can include things such as games, challenges, presentations, teachbacks where the students actually teach the rest of the class a, 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 a bit of content, or practical activities. Now the big downside of reinforcing activities in a classroom environment is the amount of time they take up. Now I know from my own personal experience of uh, designing and uh, delivering my own courses um, that a 10 minute activity, or what you think is a 10 minute activity, will probably consume about 25 minutes of classroom time. And that's taking into account all the time you need to explain the activity for uh, the students to get into their groups if it's a group activity, uh, to scratch their head and think about the activity, to perform the activity, to give any form of feedback, and then to reassemble back into their uh, seats and ready to continue with the class. And so you're always trying to find uh, the balance between keeping uh, the class as lively and engaging as possible using reinforcing activities and getting through the content in a reasonable amount of time. In e-learning, we use uh, reinforcing activities for exactly the same purpose of keeping the students engaged in the course and to embed key learning objectives. Now, it is fairly easy to build uh, individual activities. But the moment you start going to group activities in, in e-learning, then you either require the students uh, that are part of a group to come together at a specific time uh, electronically to perform the activity together, or you ne need to start looking at gamification to build much more interactive uh, games that are designed for that purpose. But of course, that will then come at a, a higher cost. Now, here's an example of a simple reinforcing activity that I've used previously on one of my courses. This activity could be done either individually or uh, the students could do it in their groups. Okay, let's do an activity. This activity can be done individually or in your group. You need to review the Lean Six Sigma to make key activities diagram on page 94 of your course notes. Once you are familiar with the diagram, you can start this activity. 
you need to drag the cards into the correct DMA column. If you try placing the cards in the incorrect DMA column, the cards will jump back into the stack. When you are ready to start the activity, click on the Start Activity button. Okay, let's move on to content discussion. In classroom-based training, most of the time is spent on information transfer or reinforcing activities. And I often feel that not enough time is set aside for the students to engage in rigorous uh, content discussion or debate. In e-learning, as I said previously, the information transfer takes place offline. Technology also provides us a great opportunity to engage in content discussion. This can be in the form of uh, discussion forum boards or online meetings using technology such as Zoom. The last of our elements is knowledge assessment. In classroom-based training, knowledge assessment typically happens at the end of the course and is often limited to the students writing some form of test or exam or performing some sort of practical activity. Now, In e-learning, I believe we have many more creative ways of doing knowledge assessment and this can be done within the middle of a module, at the end of a module, or at the end of a course. But realistically, we actually use a blend of all three of those. It is also very easy for us to apply what we call the sev uh, Teach 7, Test 1 principle, whereby we don't teach the students more than seven new concepts without testing their understanding. Knowledge assessment can be done through a combination of uh, questionnaires, quizzes, su submitted assignments, or even getting the students to journal during the course and then submit their journals for review at the end of the course. The quizzes can also have a number of different question types. Some of my favorites include true false uh, questions, multiple choice questions, fill in the word blanks, drag and drop type questions, and uh, hotspot selection. It is also possible to link your assessment to external plagiarism checking tools if that is a requirement. Badges can also be used to keep the students motivated through micro-recognition of their progress throughout the course. Now that we've covered the four elements of a course, let's talk about the tools used for creating e-learning content. In most cases, uh, we'll require a camera. Now, that could be a simple web camera for doing webcast inserts like this is. But if you are going for more polished production, then you'll need a, a professional camera. You may also want to have a green screen backdrop, uh, and I'll talk about green screening a bit later in this tutorial. Now personally, I would rather have a green screen behind me, uh, but my green screen uh, backdrop is currently in shipment from South Africa. You also need to think about your lighting. Now, as you can see, I don't have any form of um, professional lighting around me. I'm just reliant on the, the lights in this um, home office. Um, but I do suggest you, you get yourself some proper lighting and I prefer using LED lights in the temperature range 4500 Kelvin to 5500 Kelvin as this is the most natural light. Just bear in mind that uh, if you've got good video editing software you will be able to correct any uh, color tones or saturation in post-production. You also need some form of editing software. There are three products out there that you should look at. The first being Microsoft Video Editor that comes built into uh, Windows 10. And I'm actually using Microsoft Video Editor to, uh, to make this tutorial. Likewise, the Apple operating system comes with Apple iMovie. But you may need to go to a professional product, especially if you're doing green screening. Now, Adobe Premiere range has some good software in it. There's Final Cut Pro, Coral Video Studio, and another piece of software that I have used before and really like is Cyberlink Power Director. You're also going to need some e-learning content authoring software. Now you can try Microsoft PowerPoint, but you're probably going to find that you're very limited with what you can achieve with it. Personally, I am a fan of Articulate Storyline, and that's what I'm using to build this tutorial. But Adobe Captivate is also another popular uh, option, as is iSpring Suit. 
there's a lot of software out there that you can evaluate. So you really do need to do your homework and find what works best for your needs. Let me explain the chroma key concept to you. Chroma key is often what we refer to as green screening. And it's a software process that changes a specific color to be transparent. You can actually chroma key any color, but green is the one that we most often use, simply because green is not a, a common color that we found in the subject matter that we are recording. It is quite easy to chroma key static images, but once you start trying to chroma key moving video, you do require a proper professional software to deal with that. Here is a simple demonstration of the chroma key concept that I've put together using Microsoft PowerPoint. Okay, on the uh, left hand side here, we have an image of, uh, of Spider-Man on a green background. And on the right hand side, we've got the, another image and I want to put Spider-Man on top of the image on the right. So I start by selecting the image of Spider-Man and from the picture format toolbar, I select color and then down at the bottom, I set, set transparency color. I've now got a little pen and with the pen I click on the green background. That turns the green into transparent. Now you will notice there's a bit of green shadowing around Spider-Man and that's really because uh, PowerPoint is not designed for chroma key and so it doesn't have the power to handle that shadowing uh, properly. Professional chroma key software can get rid of that shadow and it can also handle a range of different uh, green color temperatures, uh, which means that if you were doing a, a, a video um, image, there is a bit of change in the color temperature as the image moves around and it's able to handle a range of green colors. Anyway, let's just take Spider-Man and let's put him on top of our image now. And as you can see, we've just done a very basic uh, example of chroma key. Now, if you're not quite sure why you would want to do green screening, let me explain it in this recording that I've done previously. Before I go into more detail on the content within this series, let me make mention of the green screen recording of these videos. As you can see, these videos are recorded in our professional green screen video recording studio. This allows us to replace a green screen with a background suitable for displaying content related text or graphics. Most importantly, we can easily customize the background with something that suits your organization's corporate identity, making the content feel like your own. Now that we've assembled our e-learning content, we need to deliver it to our students. Now in the simplest form, we can do what I've done here, where we simply create a video from our presentation and we can publish that video either on an internal intranet or if you want it to be publicly available on a platform like YouTube. Now the better option is to use a learner management system. And a learner management system or LMS is a name for software or web-based technology that allows us to create courses, to create course content and assessments, to create learners and enroll them into our courses, to monitor and report on our learners' progress, and to assess our learners' performance. I've even got customers that have linked uh, their LMS through to their website using a connector, which allows them to sell their uh, courses on their e-commerce platform. And when the um, when the uh, students have purchased the the course on their on their website, it automatically links them through to their LMS. More complex LMSs, which are often used in corporate environments, have additional functionality related to the ability to create student learning plans, the ability to schedule and manage training events, the ability to calculate and report on training costs, the ability to define organizational hierarchies, and the ability to integrate into other corporate systems, such as HR and performance management systems. When you want to publish your e-learning content, there are a number of different formats that you need to uh, be aware of. Your choice of format will depend on a number of things. Firstly, it will depend on the LMS platform you're using and what formats it support. Secondly, it will depend on the degree of interaction that's uh, built into your e-learning content. Now, if you remember back to the, the make reinforcing activity example I gave you, 
there, that was a good example of interactive content because you were able to drag the cards around the, the screen. The next thing you also need to be aware of is whether there's any form of knowledge assessment built into your content and that the scores of that knowledge assessment need to be fed back to your LMS for a student record. The common types of formats are firstly MP4 or AVI and that's your simple video format. Next we have HTML5. Now HTML5 supports interactive content but doesn't support any form of LMS feedback. The Demake reinforcing activity example uh, I showed you earlier, this was published as HTML5. The most common one around at the moment is SCORM. Now SCORM supports both interactive content and it supports LMS feedback whereby the scores that, if any scores that are captured within the package, uh, those results are fed back to the LMS uh, for a record of student learning. A newer version of that that's uh, around is something what we call Experience API or previously known as Tin Can. Now that is very similar to SCORM in terms of what it does, but it supports a new concept that's emerging that says that not all student learning happens on the LMS, and learning happens on different devices and we need a format or a standard that's able to capture this, uh, the results of that learning across multiple devices and, uh, and, and consolidate that in, in a single uh, record. A new, a new uh, standard that I've heard of just recently uh, is uh, CMR5 and this from what I can uh, see is a uh, combination of the best of SCORM and Experience API. So I expect to see some movement in, in that regards in future. There are quite a few LMS platforms to choose from. At Academy Box, we provide hosting and support for the Moodle platform. Now Moodle is the world's most used free open source LMS and it is used by thousands of schools, colleges, universities and corporates across the world. The nice thing about Moodle is there are hundreds of free and paid plugins that you can use to extend its capabilities to meet your needs. And it has a very active uh, user support community. Like all of the software that I've discussed in this tutorial, you do need to do your own research and choose an LMS that's going to best meet your needs. Okay, that's it folks. I really do hope that you found this tutorial helpful. For further information on how I can assist you with your transition to e-learning, visit our website at academybox.co.uk.